This video is sponsored by Victory Mansions. Come live in state-mandated conditions. There are a bunch of words and phrases from the book 1984 that have passed into common use, like Big Brother, Room 101, and even some that haven't been turned into TV shows. Some of them are used whenever someone wants to compare real life with 1984, sometimes accurately and usually not. Even if you haven't read the book, though, you might have heard the party's slogan haiku, War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. War is central to party ideology and propaganda, and we'll talk about it today. But of the three, the most important slogan, I think, is ignorance is strength. It's true, but whose strength? The people of Oceania, or at least everyone in the party, are taught to control not only their behavior, because they're constantly being watched for signs of unorthodoxy, but most importantly to control their minds. They learn what constitutes heresy or thought crime, which is really the only crime for party members in Oceania. Then they systematically cleanse their minds of it. Anything that goes against Ingsoc, or party ideology, is thought crime. They learn the technique of doublethink, which is when you control your own reality by deliberately forgetting things you remember because they conflict with party doctrine. If you can master doublethink, you can be happy in Oceania, because however bad things get, you'll believe the face on the telescreen when it says things are getting better. Do we have doublethink in our world? Sure. Any unpleasant truth can be pushed aside, possibly forever, if we pretend we didn't hear it or it's wrong or it doesn't make sense. We aren't taught doublethink in school like in 1984, but the people in power can rely on us to practice it regardless. Let's learn a couple more words of Newspeak, the official language of Oceania, and see if they're useful to describe our world too. First, Crime Stop. Crime Stop means the faculty of stopping short, as though by instinct, at the threshold of any dangerous thought. It includes the power of not grasping analogies, of failing to perceive logical errors, of misunderstanding the simplest arguments if they are inimical to Ingsoc, and of being bored or repelled by any train of thought which is capable of leading in a heretical direction. Crime Stop, in short, means protective stupidity. I don't know if it happens to you, but I've watched Crime Stop happening in people's heads as they refuse to listen to me. I might make a good point, based on facts, and my interlocutor will wave it aside or laugh or whatever else. They're protecting their beliefs by refusing to acknowledge facts or consider the issue in a different light. Second, black-white. Applied to an opponent, it means the habit of impudently claiming that black is white, in contradiction of the plain facts. Applied to a party member, it means a loyal willingness to say that black is white when party discipline demands this. But it also means the ability to believe that black is white, and more, to know that black is white, and to forget that one has ever believed the contrary. This demands a continuous alteration of the past, made possible by the system of thought which really embraces all the rest, and which is known in Newspeak as doublethink. Again, this term could describe a lot of people. For example, people who support politicians or believe what rich people say might choose to forget that they've heard all these things before. We're going to create millions of jobs, we're going to build infrastructure, we're going to pay off debt, we're going to stop COVID. You've heard it all before. It's just words. But some people don't remember it that way. Likewise, people are forced to act a certain way by their jobs and might have an incentive to believe what they're told about them, in contradiction of facts. In jobs like police and soldiers, it's absolutely essential. I'm keeping people safe by beating them up. We're liberating these people by invading them. Some people can't live with the lie anymore and quit, and at least in our world, unlike 1984, you can. But for most people, the lie just gets easier. 
they might reason that if they thought a different way, they'd either have to give up their paycheck and benefits or feel guilty all the time. And anyway, someone's going to do the job. The human brain has excellent powers of reasoning, so we can justify pretty much anything to ourselves. Do you think the people who drop bombs and poison gas on people in war have no conscience at all? Some of them don't, presumably. Something like 1 or 2 percent of the population has little to no conscience. But most of them just have the incentive to drop bombs. It's a job that pays better than the alternative, and you get to tell yourself you did it for your country or for freedom or whatever you like. Such people are still victims of the system, even though they're also its agents. So they might choose to tell themselves black is white. But whatever you believe, you still don't have the freedom to say anything you want. Most employees can't say or do what they want unless they want to lose their jobs and any prospect of jobs in that field. Executives can't do anything that doesn't lead to profit. No politician can tell the truth about what they do. Everyone's speech is strictly limited, so whether or not you believe what you're saying, part of your job is to make other people believe it. You could get fired for not smiling enough. Face crime is the new speak word. But hey, maybe after work you can blow the whistle on what's really happening. And give up your career and maybe your last freedom too. You won't get tortured until you believe it, like in 1984, but it just makes life easier. You could argue the right wing's perversion of language is like black-white. Right-wingers take ideas and words like feminism and socialism, triggering and cancelling, refuse to learn what they mean, make up their own meanings, and turn them against their political opponents. They'll take any term or idea that originated among people who want to change things, make up a new definition, and spread that around in order to discredit the whole idea. And since they get way more publicity than people who know what they're talking about, it usually works. Same with history. They'll take historical events, make up something that makes their group, like white people or America, look better, and then spread that around. Next thing you know, it's an article of faith on the right that black is white. For an example of the manipulation of language or history, check out any PragerU video. You will inevitably find a straw man argument or bad history. Of course, you won't realize it's a straw man or ahistorical if you don't know the original arguments. They don't even attempt to address legitimate counterarguments because they can't. Their whole worldview would come crashing down around them, not to mention the millions they get from rich sponsors. I'm planning on doing a video with like lots of examples of this twisting of language in the future, but I'll give one here. In some circles, on some YouTube channels, you can't even talk about anti-racism without someone coming along and saying, you're the racist. Maybe because you're being racist against white people, which is just silly. They'll say anything to dismiss you or shut you up. So with an Orwellian flourish, anti-racism becomes racism. Some would never admit to being racist or fascist in public despite having most or all of the required beliefs. That's why it was no surprise that when anti-fascists started getting in the news for meeting the rising threat of right-wing violence, the right started saying, anti-fascists are the real fascists. Black is white if party doctrine demands it. This black-white doesn't just take place in the mind, but throughout a subculture, just as it happens in Oceania whenever the party line changes. There's a new reality, and people who don't think that way just don't understand that black is now white. Engaging in black-white prepares you for Crime Stop. Crime Stop helps illuminate the right's fear of talking about racism. They don't mind talking about race. They're the ones always bringing out 
race-based crime statistics, as if they meant anything, or denigrating black or Latin culture with a few sweeping generalizations. But when the topic comes to white supremacy, they'll do anything to avoid talking about it or listening to people who know what they're talking about. So they created the critical race theory boogeyman. They tell everyone their kids are being taught critical race theory, which they aren't. And they tell everyone CRT is teaching white kids to be ashamed of being white. So they don't bother reading any of it, they don't try to understand it, they tell everyone what to think about it, they get people fired for teaching about racism. CRT is just for university, and it's clearly anti-racist, but they branded it as racist, so millions of people who might have learned from it, instead, they protested. We can't have our children learning real history or how systems actually work. They need patriotic education so they can stop heretical anti-American thoughts before they start and remain brainwashed their whole lives. There's a word in Newspeak for people like this who are incapable of thinking an unorthodox thought. Good thinkers. Is anyone you know a good thinker? In 1984, party members had to win the battle over themselves by controlling thought crime. This principle of self-control might be the central theme of 1984. It's not surveillance, it's not propaganda, it's not dictatorship. Those things were already commonplace in Orwell's time. They're auxiliary themes, secondary to the way the party perfects totalitarian rule. Every member of the party learns, effectively from birth, to control their own minds, to avoid thought crime. They learn to do it instinctively, blocking out any unorthodoxy before it can even become a thought. It's really just a way of closing your mind. The Newspeak term is doublethink. They also call it reality control. A lot is made in 1984 of control of the past. If you control the present, the party slogan goes, you control the past. Both in official record and in their memories, party members are constantly updating the past. If something no longer vibes with party orthodoxy, it is altered. So people are forced to remain ignorant because they can't examine records that might tell another story. Our world enables people to check past records and history books, or, to a much lesser extent, go to other countries and see what things are like there. But most people don't. Our information is certainly censored, especially in the name of national security, but people who are interested and who've studied the issues will have a good idea of what's going on without knowing the specifics. The problem in our time is not just doublethink, but apathy and incuriosity. That's why some people say life here is more similar to Brave New World than to 1984. But, well, we're already here, so let's keep going. In school, we learn history. History forms the background of what we're supposed to believe about our country. I suggest the works of James Lowen on this topic, if you're interested, which I link to in the description, to show how and why school history books are so inaccurate and misleading. The history we learn in school is supposed to teach us to be patriotic, to want to sign up and kill for the state, to see it as a noble endeavor. Most people believe what they learned in school until they learn otherwise, which might never happen. In fact, even if they learn an alternative history, they might still prefer to believe the first thing they learned and ignore the new thing. Because either, well, we tend to be biased towards things we've already learned, the story we heard first, and these are examples of the anchoring effect and conservatism bias. But there's also the possibility that it's our perceived self-interest as people identify with a nation, state, or some other institution, and we choose to believe what we've been told about it. 
Either way, it's always been possible and common to ignore unpleasant historical truths, revise them, or assume they're no longer relevant. In 1984, there is only one source of truth, the party. If you disagree, you're a traitor, you're a thought criminal, you're a Eurasian spy. In 2021, we have many possible truths and media to choose from, so it's still easy to remain sheltered and ignorant. The media paint a broad picture of how things are that might not reflect reality, but how would we know? People argue ignorance in our time is a choice, and I partly agree. But one thing we learned from the tight control of information in 1984 is if you don't know something's different in a different time, different place, or just that it could be different, you won't even consider trying to change it. As Goldstein's book reads, the masses never revolt of their own accord, and they never revolt merely because they are oppressed. Indeed, so long as they are not permitted to have standards of comparison, they never even become aware that they are oppressed. As part of keeping people ignorant, the party limits language. A party committee is at work crafting a new language, new speak, which is designed to restrict thought so much it would be impossible for future people to even imagine things like freedom, equality, and peace, because the words, and therefore the ideas expressed by the words, no longer exist. How can we get free if we can't articulate freedom? In our time, we have most of the vocabulary, but we still can't articulate a world without oppression. We're stuck in this moment, just like the people of Oceania are. We might have a glimpse into the world outside or into the past, but for most people that glimpse comes from the same sources, the same media that provide their entire worldview. So it just ends up reinforcing what they've always believed. It's not because there's one party forcing us to think the same. It's that we're surrounded by one point of view when there are billions of them out there. Our situation is much more surmountable than that of Winston Smith. We have access to books and videos and the testimony of people around the world, but we have to think to look for them. It's hard for us to imagine anything better without just comparing one government's policies with another, or telling the people with all the money, you need to do more. In other words, we have to know something else exists or could exist. We have to know there are options before we can consider them. Most people today just hope for a better version of the current system and a comfortable life for themselves. They don't all think the same, but all their thinking is limited to the range of thought the propaganda allows. That range is our orthodoxy. In 1984, eagerly describing Newspeak to Winston, his colleague says, Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. People who limit their thinking to the acceptable range of thought don't end up challenging the system, so nothing changes. Some people, and I used to be like this, have arguments in favor of just about everything done by the state or big corporations or schools or the media, yet they think they're thinking for themselves. The ruling class doesn't have to enforce uniformity of thought. Enough people are orthodox. Enough people won't do anything about or even approve of letting people struggle with money, kicking people out of their homes, locking people in cages for victimless crimes, tear gassing protesters, going to war with their tax money, and so on, so the system can continue to function. In our time, we don't have a single dominant party that we know we must all be loyal to, but we still have a ruling class. Both groups make all the most important decisions and impose them on the rest of us. Both groups feel class solidarity, except in 1984 that means loyalty to the party. In 1984, they have Newspeak. 
In our time, we have a tacit agreement on how institutions function, and questioning those institutions marks you as a radical that no one should listen to. In 1984, the party had a uniform of blue or black overalls. In our time, the uniform of the ruling class is the suit and tie. In 1984, everyone suffered from general shortages of goods. In our time, we have more than enough of everything. But not everyone has access to it because they don't have enough money. And in 1984, like today, there's a war on. Like in our world, the war in 1984 has become perpetual. War in 1984 has some of the same purposes as today's wars, and some different ones too. In our time, the main purpose of war is to fatten the pockets of people who own stock in military contractors, the so-called military-industrial complex, although that term's a bit of a misnomer, and a better, well, a proposed better term might be uh, the military-industrial-technological-entertainment-academic-media-corporate matrix. But that's a bit of a mouthful. A secondary reason that has been postulated for all these wars is to lower prices of consumer goods in the imperial core, like the US, so people don't experience too much inflation and get angry. That's the hypothesis, you know, based on the fact that one clear goal and priority of US foreign policy, like British foreign policy before it, is to open up markets abroad. You know the story. Some company builds a factory, it pays slightly better than the alternative, so locals flock to it, and work long hours in shitty conditions making cheap goods for export to the Imperial core. Or go to Iraq, conquer the oil fields, and sell them off to large corporations. It's happened over and over and over. I'm not convinced helping consumers in any way is a goal of U.S. foreign policy. Is war somehow keeping prices down? Possibly, but I don't know how you would measure it. In the meantime, people work three, four, maybe five months of the year just to pay their taxes, half of which go to military contractors. The only beneficiaries seem to be people who are already rich. The rest of us, what do we get? Widows, taxes, wooden legs, and debt. And the idea that an aggressive foreign policy somehow keeps you safer was proven wrong on 9-11, and many times since then. The people in power are well aware of what the CIA calls blowback, but protecting you and your interests is just what they say they do. It's their excuse for everything. We're doing it for you. We're keeping you safe. Don't you want to be safe? Civilian, don't you love your country? But this is a 1984. You don't have to believe it. Going to war for wealth or resources makes no sense in 1984, as no one owns any personal wealth, and the party is always trying to decrease the overall wealth of the society. The worse people have it, the more deprivation they experience, as long as they employ doublethink, the more they can be made to love the state, because they can blame their deprivation on external, unavoidable problems, while thanking Big Brother for whatever scraps of food they're allowed. As such, one goal of war in 1984 is to use up and destroy surplus production. In our time, that's not so much a goal of war as an effect as the world spends over a trillion dollars a year on war and the US government, the war-making wing of the modern empire, spends half its budget on the military. States have always made war. States are born in war. And unless they're also destroyed or bankrupted by them, wars strengthen states and enrich the people who control them. You could argue the U.S. is being bankrupted by its constant wars, but the taxpayers are still footing the bill, so the wars can continue. Wars have many attractions to a ruler. 
increase your wealth without raising taxes, while giving the people some bread and circus type opportunity to deepen their loyalty. Wars give us enemies, a group we're supposed to hate because it threatens our existence and our values, even though our rulers are a far greater threat to us, and we would know that if we weren't so distracted. Wars foster patriotism, so people value the abstract ideas and institutions that rule them over human life. Wars require, or at least seem to require, a ruling elite in charge of all the troops. Wars provide the pretext of internal enemies, which can be even scarier than the external ones because they're already here. The idea of internal enemies raises everyone's suspicion of each other. It was bad enough when everyone around you was a potential thought criminal. Now they're potential Eurasian spies, too. The party member is supposed to live in a continuous frenzy of hatred of foreign enemies and internal traitors, triumph over victories, and self-abasement before the power and wisdom of the party. The party uses war to control people's emotions. Even the humblest party member is expected to be competent, industrious, and even intelligent within narrow limits. But it's also necessary that he should be a credulous and ignorant fanatic whose prevailing moods are fear, hatred, adulation, and orgiastic triumph. In other words, it is necessary that he should have the mentality appropriate to a state of war. Fear leads to suspicion and hatred, and of course, the enemy of the moment always represents absolute evil. To stoke these emotions, every day there is a two minutes hate, where party members gather to hate on the enemies of the party. And every so often the party holds hate week, a whole week of hating on the enemy, to keep people on their toes, full of energy to release as vitriol at Big Brother's enemy. We've never had specific times to hate, but it's possible certain moments come close. Like after 9-11, seeing millions of angry people waiting to be told whom to be angry at. Or over the next year and a half, watching the news and hearing about how Iraq needed to be invaded and seeing millions of Americans fall for it. Some of those millions tried to silence people for speaking out against the war calling them traitors, unpatriotic, etc. In other words, thought criminals. Afraid of foreigners? Good, you're supposed to be. We see it in our world, we see it in 1984. No citizen of Oceania meets anyone from one of the other superstates. One literally never saw them, except in the guise of prisoners. And even as prisoners, one never got more than a momentary glimpse of them nor did one know what became of them. Apart from the few who were hanged as war criminals, the others simply vanished, presumably into forced labor camps. Nationalism cheapens someone's life just because they're foreign. Who cares what happens to them? Death, torture, slavery? Of course, we can't afford to take chances. What I mean to say, there's a war on. The foreign is either the enemy of the day or the ally who could stab us in the back at any moment. If the foreign is the enemy, it can't possibly have good ideas. So we make do with the ideas the party inculcates. Cut off from contact with the outer world and with the past, the citizen of Oceania is like a man in interstellar space who has no way of knowing which direction is up and which is down. We're not as isolated in our time, but most people rely on media from the same part of the world as them to tell them what it's like in other parts of the world. The value of gaining perspective by meeting people from different places is immeasurable. The results of failing to learn other people's perspectives are prejudice, nationalism, borders, and war. It's pointed out in the book that the social systems of the three superstates in 1984 are virtually indistinguishable, but the party member is taught to execrate them as barbarous outrages upon morality and common sense. I've mentioned on this channel that 
Contrary to what we hear or learn about, most states nowadays have roughly the same structures, and nearly all of them impose capitalism on their people. Even the ones who claim not to be capitalists still have systems of money and property and hierarchy. Each state will be more or less authoritarian than the other, but their functions are the same. Anything foreign can be a source of legitimacy for local rulers, as I explain in this video, as, a, as it's a continuously available pretext to add another layer to the national security state. One thing about being a patriot is you have to direct your hate at whichever target you're told to, whenever you're told to. I've already mentioned the two minutes hate, a hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness, a desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer, seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, turning one even against one's will into a grimacing, screaming lunatic. And yet the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion, which could be switched from one object to another like the flame of a blow lamp. The two minutes hate turns your mind into putty that the party can do what it wants with. It was even possible at moments to switch one's hatred this way or that by a voluntary act. That sounds a bit like Eric Hoffer's point in his book The True Believer. People during his time would join movements like liberal, communist, and fascist, and they would hop from one movement to another whenever one seemed to be winning. They just wanted to be part of something, wanted an evil to fight, and might become fanatics for the cause. If they had principles derived from knowledge, rather than just looking for someone to tell them who their enemy is, they would have had an easier time deciding which side they were on. But I've also seen this selective switching of hostility among nationalists many times. After 9-11, Americans all put Osama bin Laden on their shooting range targets. Within a year and a half, no one was talking about him anymore because the new enemy was Saddam. Remember, like he had been 12 years before that. No, no, not like in the 1980s when Saddam was the U.S.'s ally. <laughs> if your anger can change targets that easily, do you even know why you're angry? Why would you let the government choose your enemies for you? War is the excuse for everything in 1984, as it is in the present-day U.S., and can get shoehorned into anything. To get civilians to do aerobics, the instructor says, We don't all have the privilege of fighting in the front line, but at least we can all keep fit. Remember our boys on the Malabar front, and the sailors in the floating fortresses. Just think what they have to put up with. Those lines kind of remind me of hearing Americans compare everything to the troops and how hard life is for them, and all these self-stroking memes about how hard life is in the military. Oh, poor, poor Imperial troops. Do you know the tale of Comrade Ogilvy? One day, Winston finds he needs to rewrite a speech by Big Brother because it had mentioned someone who had become an unperson, disappeared without a trace. Party me members were supposed to pretend unpersons had never existed. To fix Big Brother's speech, Winston made up a story about Comrade Ogilvy. At the age of three, Comrade Ogilvy had refused all toys except a drum, a submachine gun, and a model helicopter. At six, a year early, by a special relaxation of the rules, he had joined the spies. At nine, he had been a troop leader. At eleven, he had denounced his uncle to the thought police after overhearing a conversation which appeared to him to have criminal tendencies. At seventeen, he'd been a district organizer of the Junior Anti-Sex League. At 19, he had designed a hand grenade which had been adopted by the Ministry of Peace and which, at its first trial, had killed 31 Eurasian prisoners in one burst. At 23, he had perished in action. 
Pursued by enemy jet planes while flying over the Indian Ocean with important dispatches, he had weighted his body with his machine gun and leapt out of the helicopter into deep water, dispatches and all. An end, said Big Brother, which it was impossible to contemplate without feelings of envy. This story doesn't sound that far-fetched to me. There are people in every country who devote their lives to the state. All states want people like this, and that's why they tell stories of heroic patriots. That said, in a modern context, the article would also have said how much Ogilvy loved his family. The war is not fought to be won. The war is fought to be continuous. There's nothing really to fight about in 1984. There are three superstates, and none of them face a realistic threat of being invaded and occupied. Like all states, their real enemies are their own populations, so keeping them ignorant is their top priority. The war is waged by each ruling group against its own subjects, and the object of the war is not to make or prevent conquests of territory, but to keep the structure of its society intact. In our time, we're at a slightly unusual stage of war. The U.S. military is engaged in a wide variety of what are called police actions around the world, but it's not apparently involved in any major wars, so we don't even really talk about them. In 2017, it was a shock for many to discover some U.S. troops were killed in a botched raid in Niger, but not enough people asked why they were there in the first place. I think maybe war is not as popular as it used to be, so news about the wars is not as prominent as it was 20 years ago. But the supposed war on terror is not winding down. I think these police actions are going to become more frequent as discontent against rulers around the world rises, and the US military is increasingly called in to put down rebellions and insurgencies around the world. As in this world, the people at the top of the social hierarchy, the inner party, have it better. They get nicer places and real chocolate. That's the whole point of power, to have a better life than the people below you. As in 1984, the people on the top, or at least their employees in the media, tell us that we're all equal, that the system treats us all equally, so we're all in this together. Yeah. In 1984, they're always destroying goods so that regular people have a harder life, but the inner party retains their little privileges. In our time, we call that austerity. There was a recession for whatever reason, totally not our fault, so we're going to be cutting social programs. That affects everyone equally, right? We're all in this together. <laughs> the inner party believes absolutely in the dominant ideology. No inner party member wavers for an instant in their mystical belief that the war is real, and that it's bound to end victoriously, with Oceania the undisputed master of the entire world. This might reflect the mentality of the ruling classes of many or all societies. To us, the ruling elite speak almost uniformly about how this system is the best system and everyone should be grateful you don't live somewhere else and it's democratic and hard work leads to money, etc., 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 etc. I'm sure a lot of them regard the whole thing as an illusion that's integral to their power, but it's likely a lot of other ones both believe and disbelieve the propaganda simultaneously, engaging in doublethink whenever necessary. We learn over our lives to conform to their system and what it demands of us. Propaganda has perfected the art of substituting words for thoughts. We give excuses and repeat slogans instead of thinking. After all, there is a war on. Words bypass the critical faculties and just flow, without thought or evidence to back them up. If, like me, you have extremist views, you might have heard someone rail against you by using a mishmash of words they've been taught to use in such circumstances. 
unpatriotic, spy, extremist, terrorist, evil, and so on. Plus, if you're not white, a bunch of racial slurs. And if you're not a cis man, a bunch of misogynist or anti-trans slurs. Some people in the public eye get these messages every day. Because people expect everyone and everything to conform to their narrow understanding of the world. It doesn't matter what time and place you live in, people with strong beliefs backed by authority will expect you to believe them too, or else you deserve to be punished with the salt mines. So in many ways, ignorance is foisted on the people, through school, the media, or wherever else we pick up propaganda, but in other ways, with the help of doublethink, we choose to remain ignorant. One thing 1984 teaches us is to appreciate the fact that in our world we can question things, that we don't have to remain ignorant or believe that black is white or 2 plus 2 equals 5. The people in power want us to believe the propaganda without question, or else, if you can see through it, that the system is impossible to resist. Don't try to resist, big brother. Surround yourself with media that reinforce your prejudices rather than learning. Engage in a little doublethink here and crime stop there whenever you hear unorthodoxy. Live in a world of comforting illusion. But I don't want to. My vision for the world does not fit under that mustache. I want a world of freedom, where people can do whatever they want, as long as they're not hurting others. I want a world where we consider each other equally worthy of life and respect. I want a world of joy and leisure, where we can do what we want, instead of the drudgery of work. I've talked about envisioning a post-capitalist world in this video and in a couple of videos in the description with some ideas on how to get there and to give your life meaning at the same time. If you read the book, and you should, you find what ignorance's strength really means is the people's ignorance is the strength of the party. In practice, the stronger the government, the weaker we are individually. If you control the system, or have privileged access to it, you have an incentive to make everyone believe the system is in their interest too. That it's a system of justice, and freedom, and peace, and the only thing standing in the way of chaos. But the more power the system has, the more violence it can and does use on more people to take more away from them. The more ignorant we are about systems that oppress us, the more power those systems have over us. Anarchists oppose all forms of oppression. Orwell might not have been an anarchist, but he might qualify as a libertarian socialist, which is a category where you would find anarchists. As thinking people, we're enemies of the state and the system it sustains.